so people don't miss out. Welcome everyone to episode three of our Lenten Wilderness series with David McGinley. So glad that you guys could join us. I uh, hope you've been finding these sessions as meaningful as I have. Um, David's been really great and very gracious. We're just going to give everyone the uh, obligatory 705 warning to get in here, finish up their meals, um, whatever it is you need to do at seven o'clock for five minutes. We'll give that chance. I uh, figured out how to get some music pumped in here. So just kick back and chill for a couple of minutes and we'll open with a prayer and get going. Barb and Jim Heldman, what? Long time no see, guys. Good to see ya. Thanks for getting on here. You know, I still have your painting in my office, Jim. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, one he's, last instruction here. Too. He's able to see everybody. Uh, yeah, I can see. Um, David's got some new technology this week, so we're gonna ask everyone to switch to speaker view instead of gallery when he speaks. Um, just so you can see his slides in greater detail. Otherwise, they'll just be in the tiny little tile that you see him in here. I don't know what that is. Oh, see what yeah. happens. Sorry, Ronnie. Uh, yep. Where would I find that? Uh, at the top of where uh, the viewing section is, you'll see a little tab that says view. Yes. Click on that. You'll have the option between speaker view or gallery view. You'll still have some tiles along the top so you can scroll through to see your friends and what have you. Um, <clears throat> but just when he's uh, presenting the slides and whatnot, you'll want that on speaker just to, so you can see in greater detail what he's on about. Thank you. No, thank you. Glad no, to thank see you. you. <laughs> Are we going to get into a thank you war here? <laughs> because I have the last word, dear. I'll give it to you. No problem. Just so that I can, can I just say that the slides are not, uh, do not interfere with the gallery view? Uh, right, but he has a different uh, technology, some kind of switcher. So he's not going to be sharing his screen. Oh. Okay. Um, he will be, I guess, but you'll have to put it in um, speaker view when the time comes. So we're at 7.05. I'm going to uh, drop our music down here as much as it pains me. Maybe we should just run it the whole time. Oh, have a chill session. Yeah. That might affect the cadence of your speaking. Oh, thank you, Tracy, for the uh, comment there. All right, that seemed like a good time to pull it right out before we get on to the next cut. All right, still some stragglers coming in. Um, but we don't want to waste David's time. He's um, come, coming to us off another session. So uh, let's uh, try to be gentle on him. And let us begin with a prayer, shall we? Oh, am I still sharing my screen? I'm going to stop this share. Okay, there. Now you should be able to switch to speaker. Uh, oh, I'm getting a note here from Angelina. Thank you, Angelina. It says, if you're the host, then you can spotlight David McGinley on everyone's screen. Um, oh, I guess I probably got to go to your tile. Mm, no, I don't want to be there. Can you, I don't want to be there too. Oh, spotlight. Let's try that. Hey, nice. Thank you, Angelina. This is why we invite the young people in to help us with the technology. Okay, so let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Spirit, we want to acknowledge your essence that's breathing through us at every single moment. We're so grateful that with your help, we're able to gather on this evening 
We ask that you open our hearts and minds to David's message this evening and hold us in your grace as we navigate this Lenten wilderness journey. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All well, right. good evening, everyone. Great. Uh, great to be with you again and, um, and to continue sharing insights into the astonishing mystery and beauty of who and what we are. In um, the first week, we, uh, we clarified how the ego identity really lays at the surface uh, of who and what we are, and it is like clothing that we wear in the moment and as we navigate through life and how that evolves and shifts as we go move into different relationships and experiences and is challenged by suffering, by conflict, uh, by meditation. It is deconstructed uh, through those things and it that triggers its defense mechanisms, right? So this is the way in which ego self-preservation is maintained, but ultimately it breaks down and is eroded uh, as we leave this world. And that is required in order to reveal the actual essence of who and what we are as children of God. And we talked about how God is that underlying consciousness from which we and all reality emanates and are sustained in every moment. We also explored love. Love not as an emotion, but as the highest state of consciousness for God is love. So our mission is to work compassionately and with a sense of humor, with our ego identity, and wear it as a fine piece of clothing, but also to learn how to love as the underlying wisdom wired through us. And in loving others and being love, we amplify the, uh, the realm of spirit, the realm of God, Jesus was challenged to do that in the wilderness during 40 days, tempted to set ego uh, self-preservation aside and move in the direction of spirit and love, of trust and vulnerability, which is essential for true strength in this world. That's something we, uh, we bumble along with. Last week then, we went deeper with that, uh, exploring the dimensions of uh, consciousness. And uh, this week, we're gonna go even further into that. And I'm gonna show you some scientific insights into who and what we are as non-physical beings. That's a pretty bold claim. I invite you to receive this information uh, with curiosity and to ask questions about it and to entertain a new paradigm or a new model of what lies beneath the flesh and bone and uh, how we now have technology which can actually explore to a limited extent the interface between spirit and body, between consciousness and experience. This is gonna be uh, interesting, different, and not stuff you'd normally hear on a, on a Sunday morning. It doesn't preach well. <laughs> I have tried, but it makes for a, a delightful rabbit hole into Wonderland. So let's begin. The traditional model dominant in our Western culture is that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain. It arises from the billions of synapses and neurons within the brain. It arises as an accidental phenomenon of that massive computing power uh, that is limited, that is held in the three pounds of gray matter between our ears. Sure doesn't feel massive when you own that computer power. <laughs> it often functions in ridiculous ways. But I'd like to, to share some astonishing insights into how really brilliant it is and dive right down to the quantum level. In that traditional model that consciousness arises from the brain, the uh, 
it, it, it can be expressed in terms of material reductionism. What you see is what you get. Remember last week, I mentioned that the universe is not what you see is what you get. The universe is made up of things we can see, that's 0.004% of the entire content of the universe. And then all the matter in the universe we cannot see, all the electromagnetic spectrum that is outside of the visible range of light, that comprises 4% of the entire universe. And then 26% is dark matter, and 70 over 70% is something called dark energy, which is really total mystery. So if, we can, if it's unwise to put all of your chips on 0.004%, what then are we? How can we entertain the mystery of how we emanate from this underlying consciousness of the universe in a way that is contemporary, very intelligent, uh, sophisticated, and measurable? Let's dive. So. Can you all see this slide? This is, uh, this is the periodic table, right? And um, we, this is the material reductionist model. That's where it begins. And uh, the understanding is that life emits from matter. And when we're talking about a human being, there are many layers of that, that science and medicine is very good at understanding the skeletal layer, the neurological layer. This is the artwork of Alex Gray. Uh, very grateful for permission to use this. Um, he is an astonishing artist. This is the lymphatic system, and then moving into the, the visceral, the, the organs, and then the muscular system, right, the, the muscular skeletal. We are multifaceted, amazing creatures in these miraculous bodies, which can give life and emanate light itself. This level is not known very well to modern science. This is the meridian system, the chakras or the energy centers. And again, I mentioned last week that this stuff can now be measured. Traditionally, it's been part of mysticism, but now technology exists such as quantum interference, multi uh, magnetometers and photomultipliers, to actually measure this. In fact, this meridian system of energy with little nodes or points, that coincides very well with the Chinese acupuncture map of the body. But then it goes beyond that to higher levels of consciousness. And these are manifest or revealed as one dies. You're moving into what's called transpersonal realms of consciousness and then into ultimate disembodiment and then union with spirit. That's pretty astonishing, but you don't see it when you look in the mirror. It may seem utterly fantastic. Uh, it may seem ridiculous uh, when you think of how all we know, all we can feel is the physical. But I would challenge you on that. And I want to invite you now to experience the non-physical. So we're going to do an exercise. Can you experience yourself as a being of energy, something that is someone that is manifest from a level of reality that is not material, right? That is pure energy and consciousness and something beyond our vocabulary? Well, you can, in a very crude way. I'd like you to do this with me. Now, if you feel something, I want to encourage you, if you feel something in this exercise, that's lovely and wonderful, but it doesn't mean you're anything special. And if you don't feel anything in this exercise, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything is wrong with you. Let me, I'll explain why after we do the exercise. So to do this, you have to sit comfortably. Hope you can sit up in your chair. You do this with me. This, this may be the first time you've, you've felt yourself as an energetic being. So this, this should be interesting. Close your eyes. Remember that breathing exercise? Four seconds in, little pause. 
six or eight seconds out. Just do that a few times. Gently breathing in. Let the air flow. Now as you're breathing, feel the seat supporting your body. Feel your feet planted on the floor. If you could place your hands, palm facing up, place them on your lap and gently breathe. Feel your body, the weight of it. And if your mind is wandering, let it go. Don't stop it. Just feel your body, feel the moment. You want to do this gently. Okay, now I ask you to open your eyes so you can see what I'm going to do. You can see my cat behind me, always a companion on these, these conferences these presentations. I'd like you to place your hands close together, but don't touch. But like that. And I'd like you just with a relaxed feeling, not trying too hard, sense the space beyond your fingertips. And then gently move your hands like this, but don't touch them. Just sense the space beyond your fingertips, in between your hands. If you want, you can do this. Imagine, invite light or spirit to flow in through your head, into your body and out through your hands, through your fingertips. Gently move them like this. Again, don't put a lot of effort into this, just relax. Okay. Now you can put a, a comment up if, if you like, and I'll, I'll have some uh, conversation later uh, after the, the talk, but you can put some comments in. Notice if you feel anything between your fingertips. Notice if you sense it, it's gonna be very subtle. This is something that is part of the healing arts, the laying on of hands in which energy flows through to another person and you're sending love, right? Just send love and compassion. This is a beautiful mystery that is only now, well, for the past 20 years has been revealing itself to the scientific method and resulting in some startling insights into who and what we are as energetic beings. Now I bring this up thinking in particular of the story of Jesus who healed the woman who had that flow of blood, remember? I mentioned this last week and she touched the edge of his robe and he paused in the crowd that was pressing in around him and he said, who touched me? I felt energy flow from me. And he instructed his disciples and followers, lay your hands on the sick. Right? And there are accounts in the Gospels of the disciples doing just that and people actually being healed and restored. Does that sound like an audacious thing that uh, you could do? I felt that way. I was, um, I was in the hospital uh, visiting a woman who had had an orthopedic knee replacement. And uh, she uh, was in considerable pain, though her composure wouldn't reveal that. I uh, sat with her and her husband. And uh, I asked, well, what, what is your pain right now? And she said, well, uh, seven or eight out of 10. 
I said, oh, let, 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 let me try something. And I, I flowed my hand. I moved my hand over her knee and down, but I didn't touch her, right? My hand was about this bar above her knee, and I just let that flow through, and I'm just calmly, gently sending in love and compassion and asking spirit to flow through me, right? Remember last week we, we talked about doing things in the name of Christ, which means to do it in the character, right? In the relationship that Jesus had with God, that openness, doing it in the same orientation of consciousness that Jesus had. Well, we can do that in a little way, right? So I, I tried my in my way to be that opening and trusting and just flowing that through. It's interesting, her eyes got wide. And she said, are you touching me? And I said, well, you can see I'm not touching her. And her husband was watching. He said, he's not touching you. And he said, but she said, I can feel that. I can feel tingling and energy. I said, well, that's very nice. How's your pain? And she said, it's, it's going down. And it went down from a seven or eight, down to a five, down to a three, and then it was gone. Very interesting. I see uh, some people are commenting on what they felt. Center of my palms got really hot. Yeah, Colleen, I feel a presence, a mass of energy between my hands, moving my hands in and out. Felt like pressing in and out on a partially filled balloon. That's a great description. That's a good one. Some people describe electricity, magnetism, right? Like we used to do two magnets bouncing off their polar opposites. That's right. That's the feeling. You have this energy field. And now it can be measured, and uh, yet the most sensitive instru instrument to detect it is you, your body, or another human being. So I could feel the energy around her knee, and I do this with patients. I feel the injury from, uh, you know, the, the trauma from a surgical incision or from, um, from the depleted energy from chemotherapy. Uh, I feel something between my hands like something attracting and repelling at the same time. Yes, Suzanne LeBlanc, that, that's exactly it. Maybe this is the first time you felt this. Tingling in my thumbs, but a heaviness between my hands. Well placed, well, well described. Okay, so if we arise, if we emanate from and are sustained by a consciousness or a dimension of energy and light and non-material reality, Where's the interface? Uh, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, this, this is going to be a bit technical. So again, if you're on speaker view, then uh, you should be able to see this very well. This is from the work of Dr. Stuart Hameroff and Dr. Roger Penrose. Dr. Hameroff is a professor of anesthesiology at Arizona State University. And um, Roger Penrose is an expert in black hole quantum physics. He is a contemporary of Stephen Hawking. So the two of them had noticed uh, independently a phenomenon arising within our body. And they began corresponding and uh, came up with the most robust theory of consciousness, demonstrating the interface between this level of reality and what's called the quantum level of reality, quantum energy. They called it orchestrative objective reductionism. And if you want, you can go to quantumconsciousness.org and investigate. So in the standard model, consciousness arises right through the neurons firing. That's the material reductionist model. But now we know within each neuron, there are all these cylinders or polymers called microtubules. And each of those are made up of individual subunits, protein subunits called tubulins. And these open and flex between open and closed, right? Functioning really as a biological transistor gate, like in a computer. And it is driven by quantum mechanical processes. Quantum energy is affected through a phenomenon called gravitic collapse. And it shifts from a quantum energy, which is, um, doesn't operate in this space and time frame of reference. It shifts from a quantum state of pure potential to a Newtonian state of uh, pure actuality. Um, so what manifests, what results is a particle of light. 
spontaneously appears within the body emanating from these microtubules and interestingly emanating from our DNA. The helix emanates light in the infrared range. Penrose and Hamroff discovered that the frequency, how fast the particle of light is vibrating, and the amplitude, the power curve that it's vibrating with, will carry information. It will cause a cascade effect within the cell that eventually will regulate every metabolic process within the body. Particles of light are spontaneously appearing every 15 nanoseconds and pulsing out of every cell of our body and especially through the DNA. Quantum energy is shifting to the material level of reality and shining out within you. You are literally the light of the world. That is astonishing, but it's nothing new. Here is the textbook used in second year biochemistry, uh, and it's used by medical students, Principles of Biochemistry by Albert Leninger. I think it's page uh, 735. Uh, this is in its 10th edition. Um, I, I have a copy of the second edition. Uh, it talks about biophotons and how they pulsate out from the cells in the DNA and they regulate, right? They cause the regulation of every system in the body. One pulse, 50 nanoseconds, right? One pulse is a moment of now. A stream of them is what we would call a stream of consciousness. So there was a lot of criticism of this theory of consciousness because quantum collapse uh, can't happen, the scientists, other physicists said, except at almost absolute, absolute zero temperatures. But now, Hameroff has observed and, and shown that it happens in body temperature and higher temperatures. So just amazing, great contemporary model of the interface between this reality and maybe the intermediary stage of reality, the quantum field. And then beyond that is, well, we don't have instruments to measure what's beyond that. We will never be able to measure what's beyond that because in scientific or mathematical terms, uh, this world we live in is what may be called the subset of a mathematical equation. So that's within the brackets of a longer equation. The function of the subset cannot explain the function of the superset, the full equation. In the same way, we in this material reality are in unable. We do not have the hardware or the software language to articulate with any accuracy, accuracy dimensions beyond the quantum. But this is exciting. Wouldn't it be cool if you went to church and uh, you were trained in how to experience yourself as a spiritual being, as a being of energy. Well, what would you do with that? Could you help others? Yes, you can. Here is a great study. This is an old one, and I'm pulling it up because it, it was very, uh, very well done. Dr. Bernard Grad, who I'm, I'm grateful to have met in his 101st year, uh, was examining wounds uh, in, uh, that they cut up on the back of mice. And um, a healer, his name was Oscar Estebeni. He was from Hungary and a gifted healer, wonderful man. Uh, he would place his hands close to the, uh, the mice. Now, the mice were in a little cage that was in a paper bag. So he didn't know what was in the bag. He probably heard the mice, I agree. Uh, and there were three groups uh, one set, 100 mice were in the banks and had the wounds. Well, they all had the wounds. 100 of them were the control group. Uh, 100 of them were healed, right? Were, were the healer placed his hands near them. And then another 100 were just held by students and um, who, who thought compassionate thoughts, right? And what they found was after 14 days, here's the before and after in the size of the wounds. And you can see that those wounds that were treated by the healer had uh, healed and shrunk uh, to a considerable length. 
That's exciting. And the key in that, uh, in that healing was that uh, it was done lightly. It wasn't done with control. It doesn't, wasn't done with anxiety. It's done with a sense of openness and relaxation and being fully, as much as we can, fully present in this moment and letting it flow through us, not from us. Here was Dr. Bernard Grant's conclusion his, uh, in his paper. He said, we're dealing with an energy that knows what it wants to do, right? That is to heal and make whole again. The healer didn't need to know that these were mice and that the, their backs were injured. I didn't need to know the nature of the nerves and the muscles that were in that woman's knee that had been replaced. I just needed to send in compassion and be open. So natural is this flow, this energy, that nothing can stop it, interestingly. Enough, though, um, except a manifestation of fear or anger. That's fascinating when you think of, of Jesus' instructions to, um, to trust the Spirit, to be an instrument of God, and how fear is actually something that separates. It, it increases our sense of separation from God, from Spirit from that underlying consciousness from which we emanate. Fear is the ego voice that says, I'm in danger, I'm afraid, I don't like this, I want power. Remember, uh, esteem, uh, community or belonging, and agency, sense of power, the three driving forces in ego. And when it can't get them, it will try to manipulate reality. It will try to exert power over others, it will try to influence the situation so that it feels safe. But spirit, right, soul, is about opening up, saying, I don't know what's happening. I will sit with the ambiguity. I will let the, the spirit flow through me. I have no answers, but the answer is me. Fascinating. Now, there was some uh, other studies on exactly what was going on with this energy, uh, water seems to retain it quite a bit. Um, when, when a healer places their hands ar around water, a uh, cup of water, the spectroscopic properties of it change. It absorbs infrared light. Remember, infrared light is being emitted from the microtubules, right, and from the DNA. Here is another fascinating study that shows how it regulates the metabolic processes and the intelligence of the body. This is a study, changes in bioelectric signals trigger formation of new organs in regenerative medicine. Uh, it has implications for regenerative medicine. So they changed the electrical signal, the frequency and the amplitude of cells in this tadpole, poor tadpole. And what resulted was a new eye began to grow in the gut section. They changed this, the uh, programming language of the body. They manipulated that and it instructed a new organ to grow where it's not designed to. <sighs> Regenerative medicine, energy medicine, in terms of programming the cells is in its infancy, but it's being implemented. For example, uh, a, a difficult brain tumor called glioblastoma has been shown to be very responsive to um, an, an, an electrical signal that disrupts the mitosis or cell division within the cancer cells of the glioblastoma, but it doesn't affect the mitosis of the healthy cells in around the, the tumor. So the way they did this was they constructed a ball cap with electrodes in it that were targeting, tar they were angled to target a tumor in, in the patient. So these electrical signals going into the tumor, which dissolved, which died because the cells couldn't divide anymore. The mitosis disruption just shattered by, by this new uh, electrical information, this biomagnetic signal. Within six weeks, the tumor was gone. Fantastic. Now it grew back in the same median time that regular ones do, but you can put on the ball cap again, retarget, and eradicate it. No surgery, no chemotherapy, no radiation. Just fantastic. 
still stuff in its infancy, but really interesting to see. Here's another study. I may have mentioned this one last week, showing the effect of your consciousness as you direct your energy. Again, we're exploring the amazing mystery of who and what you are. You're not what you think. You are more than your body, more than your mind. This is the effect of compassionate intention as a therapeutic intervention by partners of cancer patients over distance. So cancer patients and their partners were involved in this and the partners were trained in, medit in a compassionate meditation and focused prayer. And they sent it at intervals of about 10 seconds to, uh, to uh, over a 30 minute period. And what they found was the galvanic skin response, right? The electrical conductivity through the skin synchronized in the patient and their partner. I'd mentioned the Institute of Heart Math is advancing this sort of research. Uh, fascinating. So we gather on Sunday, well, virtually now, but we gather and we have prayers of the people. You can actually affect the local environment and perhaps affect those people through the compassionate intention and openness of your heart. Do not be attached to the outcome. It's not for you to control. That's the ego talking. But instead, be an open instrument. Fascinating stuff. Global Consciousness Project is uh, picking this up. I, I think I had mentioned this one. Uh, this is one in which 66 random number generators have been placed around the planet to sense ripples in the field of consciousness. And it's been running since, uh, well, for about 20 years. And uh, it's being led by the Institute of Nordic Sciences, and here's their website. And what they found was when there is a big event in the world, these random number generators synchronize. They're not connected to the internet. They're not connected to each other. They're independently monitored. But when a big event happens that stirs the consciousness of people, these things synchronize. They noticed it when Princess Diana died, Princess of Wales. They noticed it during the World Day of Prayer and they had a big synchronizing during 9-11. And you can go to the website and check out other world events that have happened and how these two number generators seem to reflect all the consciousness of humanity resonating with the same energy, whether that be grief or joy, right? Uh, fascinating. It means there's no such thing as a private thought. That makes me nervous. <laughs> it means that you are so much more than what you think you are. It means that your prayers for your children and for the world during this pandemic have an impact. Send your compassion and love. I spoke with uh, a woman who had a near-death experience and uh, she said during it, she was walking by a river and there was a, a guide with her and there were columns of light coming out of the water. And uh, she asked what they were and she was told those are the prayers of the people. Those are their intentions. And the ones that are rather diffuse and gray, they don't have a lot of investment, emotional or energy investment, right? But the ones that are beams or they were pillars of spectrums of light that were shooting up. And she was told those tend to be the prayers of mothers for their children. Just amazing. It points to a reality beyond the one through which we live and move and have our being. It points to the 99.006% of reality beyond the visible spectrum of light. So what is the reality? Science has something to say about it, and this has a distinctly spiritual ring to it. There's an ancient woodcut this is a, a piece of art. I forgot who the artist is. It's, it's very well known in which uh, a monk is peeking through the veil to the reality beyond. It is uh, something that is now understood to be the most concrete, or that's a poor word to choose, the most robust theory of reality of all, that we live in a hologram. This was the conclusion. <laughs> of Professor Stephen Hawking in his last paper that was published after his death. That the Big Bang didn't happen at one point 
and then extend out over time and space, that all of it, in all moments, is a projection from a higher dimension of reality. You and I are part of that projection, right? Think of St. Paul saying, God is that through which we live and move and have our being. There was a wonderful book that explained this so succinctly. It was written in 1866 by a school teacher, um, Edwin Abbott, and it's called Flatland. And in it, he tells a parable of citizens that were just two-dimensional shapes, circles, squares, triangles, and they moved about in a two-dimensional world. It had no depth, right? There was no z-axis, there was just x and y, and they moved about their, their world, living their lives. One day, a circle in his two-dimensional home had uh, an interlocution, had a sense of a presence in the room, and he couldn't shake it, and he called out, reveal yourself. And what happened was confusing. A circle, small, appeared in his realm, in his flat two-dimensional realm. And the circle became larger and larger and larger, and then smaller and smaller and smaller. What had happened was he was contacted by a three-dimensional being, a sphere. But he had no frame of reference and no neurological framework or structure to comprehend a three-dimensional being. He only knew a two-dimensional world, and he could not articulate or imagine a higher dimensional reality. The sphere had moved through his plane, and it just appeared as a circle getting larger and smaller and disappearing. In his confusion, he called out, I don't understand. Please show me. So he was taken momentarily from his two-dimensional world to the three-dimensional where he perceived things that were beyond imagination. Form, solid structures, the X, Y, and Z axis of existence. When he returned, uh, he tried to tell his friends and they didn't understand and they felt he was a fool and then someone had gone mad. That's a good metaphor for what we experience. And science now says not only is this perceived reality only 0.004% of what's out there, but all of it is an emanation from a different dimension, a higher dimensional reality. Um, the scientific term for this is that we live in something called a quasi-crystal. Think of it this way. If you have an object uh, and you can measure, I'm going to use my hand, you can measure that, but you see the shadow that is cast, well, you can't see that. If something is casting a shadow, that shadow, shadow is termed as a quasi-crystal. It is a two-dimensional form of the three-dimensional object. You can analyze that two-dimensional shape and interpret, extrapolate some properties of that higher dimensional reality from it. That's the closest we can get to uh, trying to understand what we live and move in. And um, it really is mind boggling. And those who have a near death experience, those who have a mystical experience of the spirit speaking to them, who have a sense of connection, unexplainable to all that is, who are filled with that peace and knowing they have been temporarily transformed by the underlying reality from which we all emanate. Fortunately, you don't need to die in order to experience this, but you can't make it happen. It's a gift, it's grace. In the Lutheran tradition, we always say, as much as it may feel that you are the one praying to God, that you're the one seeking out God, any movement towards God is only a response to God's movement first towards us. Why? Because all of reality emanates from this divine consciousness we call God, source, ground of being. So any movement we have is simply 
a ruffling, a rustling, a turning, and a pulling to the awakening that is awaiting everyone. You are more than you seem. All of this is a projection, no less real for us or necessary for our growth into love, but don't be fooled. There, there is a reality more real than this one, and it will come upon all of us, and it's all going to be okay. In the meantime, we are all walking each other home and bumbling towards ecstasy. So I'm going to stop there, and um, uh, let's open it up to some chats and some conversation. I'm really grateful that you... Uh, you entertain the idea that you could be more than more than your body, right? So let's unmute and have a conversation. I'm going to temporarily pause though and let the cat out of the room because it's been scratching at the door. Hang on. Well, David lets the cat out of the bag. I invite you guys to. Uh, oh, well, first we'll go back to gallery mode here. Uh, add your comments to the side, if you so desire. I'll get this music back for a sec. Oh, yeah. Suck it to me one time. <laughs> okay. That was for you, Jeezy. <laughs> so, let's have a chat. Oh, your cat's you can, uh... meowing through the door, I guess. Yeah, and uh, you can put it back to gallery view. Um, yep, we've done that. Although you, I might need to take this spotlight off. Yes. There we go. Um, if I if I may jump in, uh, a lot of what you were talking about uh, relates, I think, to perceptions of heaven. Uh, you know, that's the sort of uh, I love how you talk about impoverished words. You know, heaven. The word heaven only hints at the things that you've just described. Yes. Um, uh, our words are shadows trying to reveal substance. Right? Our, our words are, um, you know, like the edge of a leaf being blown by the wind. We're unaware of the entire tree, let alone the forest. And the wind and the energy and the earth that sustains it. So any questions or comments on, on this? I see someone mentioned, yeah, Rita, you use therapeutic touch. Yes, what I, what I do is uh, therapeutic touch. And uh, on your dog during a thunderstorm, yeah, and it worked. Lucky dog. And I took a course in it, yeah. So, David. Ronnie, do you want to have people? Hey, Jim. Want people raise their hands or? I need to raise my hand. Sorry, I'm just on oh. mute there. So, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a reactions tab. And if you hit that, you'll see a raise hand tab. So, if you could do that, that'll bump you right up to the top of our screen and we can see who you are and we'll be sure to get you in here. So bottom of the screen, there's a reactions tab. And there you can raise your hand and it'll bring you to the top. James Anderson. Oh. Uh, off you go. I'm, I'm glad your cat showed up um, on screen because I think your cat understood the energy that was in the room, <laughs> even though he wanted out. Yeah, he wanted out when I was done, yeah. <laughs> Animals seem to be very responsive to this sort of subtle energy. Okay. Thank you, James. Looks like he's muted himself. I guess that's it. Who's next? Uh, looks like Tracy wrote something. It's a direct message though. Tracy, or for anyone, if you want this, your message to be seen by the whole group, you have to click on um, the word everyone. It should be at the top of your list when you click on who you want to address it to. Um, 
Let's see, I'll just read it out loud to save us time. So when you spoke about looking through the veil, that made me think of thin places and the energy that comes from places within the earth to make us feel something sacred, that energy emanating. Yes, I'm fascinated by that. I even wonder if the intention and consciousness of the people who have been in those sacred locations through the eons amplifies it as a thin place, right? A place where uh, the veil is is gossamer thin and where the energy can be perceived. Uh, it also teaches me that my job is to tune myself. Remember a ritual, it tunes your consciousness to love, to mystery, to, to the sacred, to the, to the great unknown. So when I'm in those places, it, when I go to church on a Sunday or when I, when I sit alone in, in my own prayer, can I get out of my own way? Can I tune myself to love? Yeah, every now and then. Thank you, David. Just want to make a quick point Fiona and Tapio shared with me. Um, you might not see the reactions tab unless you have your um, <clears throat> participants opened, your list of participants opened, which is another tab down there. So if you're not seeing the reactions tab, try opening your participants or chat or both and see if uh, that reaction tab shows up. Susan, Susan Dunn said, she, she, she reminded of a quote, ever since happiness heard your name, it's been running through the streets trying to find you. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful that love is pursuing you? That it's seeking you out with infinite patience and greater wisdom than you could ever comprehend? Hmm. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to say that a few, well, a few years ago, I had the healing touch person, you know, sort of scan my body. And mm. she mentioned, she said, when I get around your kidney area, it's like a teeter totter. Well, you know, I never thought anything more about that until uh, two or three years later, I had this CAT scan done. Uh, nothing to do with any lumps or bumps, but uh, I had low platelet count. And lo and behold, they found a spot on my left kidney. And I often went back to, to what Anita said, that the spot must have been there, a lump or something. And it was teeter-tottering and she was able to sense that, which turned out to be a blood-filled uh, yeah. uh, blood vessel it wasn't cancer but uh it was talking what you were saying about healing touch so i just wanted to share that thank you it reminds me of a treatment i gave a, a daughter of friends of mine and my hand started vibrating over her throat i had no idea what it was uh, it turns out later she had a thyroid condition okay. um so even when I'm giving treatments, it doesn't mean I'm really tuned in uh, here and can understand. I don't understand what I'm sensing. I don't know what it is. I can only say, well, I felt something here. And, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, Who's next? I just want to read a comment from Harry. In your proposal, would you say whether God is a projector or is the projection? Well, I think God is still a human concept, right? Uh, that ultimate entity, that ultimate consciousness or whatever it is, is beyond words. And uh, uh, what I'm referring to is the projector itself. Um, but beyond that, I can only rest in silence. And that may be the wisest thing I could ever say. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Don't be shy, everyone. There's only a few more of these sessions left, so get it in there while you got the chance. Do I need to bring my music back in here? Oh, here we go, Colleen. Can you unmute yourself, please? 
Oops, sorry, I accidentally hit it again. Can you do it one more time, please? <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm just wondering, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I'm wondering why life on this side of, of the, of the great, why is life so fraught with uh, blindness? I don't mean physical blindness, blindness, um, difficulties, um, problems, you know, the whole gambit. Why is life, to me, it seems like life is set up to keep us from this, to block the view of this transcendence beyond life, and I, I don't understand that. Well, it's, I, I, I appreciate that frustration. Uh, it certainly does feel like that. I don't know what I can say accurately to that other than we seem to be very good at messing things up. So um, we, we're good at blinding ourselves and others from that love and that reality. Uh, I also, my imagination entertains the idea that it's a, it's a huge universe, probably filled with life. And our situation may not be common. Perhaps on other worlds, they do have a direct communion with that underlying invisible reality. Maybe they have a different relationship to it. Um, I, I can't imagine that everyone is so lost as us. Uh, so I, I don't know, but let's, let's wake up to love and help each other be kind, right? Be compassionate. I, I still believe, as naive as it may sound, that love is stronger than fear and pain and that the underlying reality is so wise that nothing will be wasted here, even though it's such a struggle. I so think, I um, take from what you said, just to follow up, um, the problem begins with our human weakness or failings rather than the nature of the process from God or from Yes. Um, uh, there's a wonderful saying, a miracle is the most natural thing in the world. It's when it doesn't happen that indicates something has gone wrong. Right? So we keep suppressing and turning away from this underlying reality, which is not destructive. How do we do that while still being embedded in the evolutionary process? Because that involves struggle, pain, and growth. I don't know. If I may I jump in on that too, David, um, you know, scripture is a never ending cycle of God trying to teach us um, and expand our imagination about what, what these things are about. And Jesus was, you know, probably the best at it, I guess, in, in human terms of explaining. Um, and we keep messing it up, but God continues to give us chance after chance. Um, yeah. never giving up on us. Geraldine asked, are we all here for some lesson to be learned? Well, there's lessons for everyone. And I think the fundamental lesson is to grow, to use even suffering in order to grow into love itself. And if you're like me, you do that inconsistently and sporadically with resistance and then sometimes with abandon. Yeah. Deanna G. Yes, um, you've shown us tonight that um, if we are fully present, we could, you, we could bring healing to others from that force of energy that flows out from us. My question is, are we able to do that for ourselves? If our pain body takes over and we're in pain, are we going to be able to open ourselves to receive that in energy that we can now do it to ourselves if someone is not there to do it for us? 
Yes, I have spoken with teachers who have shown me that that is possible. But I'm not a great student. When I have been in pain, I have not been able to reduce it and eliminate it in myself. Um, it is a difficult thing to stand back and watch your own experience of pain. But that is the key. To feel the physical pain and then to step back and observe yourself feeling that. In that step, you open up to the potential of reducing it through a shift in the energy of your consciousness. But I've never been good at that. <laughs> Sorry to jump in here so much here, but that question sort of begs another question. Uh, can we have compassion for ourselves, I guess, or, is, or does something else happen there? Yeah, the most difficult person to have compassion for because the ego voice jumps up and says, you're not that good. Or it jumps up and says, oh, you're better than that. Um, gratitude, right? Gratitude is always the best way to go to when you're feeling sorrow, suffering, emotional or physical, to begin to focus and manifest gratitude for someone or something that, you know, fear cannot exist where gratitude is dwells. So I think that refer alludes to the scripture that says give thanks to God in all situations. I think they were onto something. Absolutely. How many how much longer do you want to stay on here, David? How much time do you got for we got oh, we're at 904. How about, how about five more minutes? My neck is starting to go. We don't want that because we need to. I need a new office week. chair. It's a good excuse for a new office chair. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all the shy people out there, let's hear from you. I think Clint is trying to do something here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for coordinating this and uh, observation, maybe David can comment on it. Um, I'm also, a, a, I don't know if you could call it a fan, a sibling of Richard Rohr, uh, in, spiritually, not uh, by blood, but uh, he, he talks about uh, the non-dual thinking. And, and uh, I, I think our, our dualistic thinking becomes a, a, a significant barrier in a lot of what we're trying to discuss here because we, we're, we're stuck in our heads. You know, like Descartes said, I think therefore I am, but you're talking about so much more. Yeah. Yes, we continue to slip into that dualism and the thinking. God is out there and I'm here. Um, the awakening is the realizing that I and everything emanate from and am sustained by that dimension of consciousness. I could never be separated from it. And if you remember in the first session, I said, that matter is the densest form of spirit. So there's no dualism, right? There's a spectrum of energetic em emanation and density and co coherence. Um, but the dualism is part of the perceived separation. I don't know, it's very frustrating. <laughs> it's very convincing. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, one of the liberations I experienced through uh, my readings of Richard Rohr and so on was to, you know, become a, quite a bit more free of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that's why we, uh, you know, to bless those who persecute you, 
because you know that they're your brother, your sister. To, to bless them is to help them awaken to the reality, to the awareness that we, we all emanate from the same source. We all are connected, right? Because your consciousness is the real estate you share with, with God. Yeah. Looks like Margaret. Is. Oh. oh Margaret like just commented. I, I have to admit that trying to grasp what you are saying is a bit like trying to form a ball out of a tub of water. I end up with wet hands, but find it hard to grasp all of what you're talking about. I appreciate how difficult that is. It, it's, it's strange material. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope that I can articulate it with some clarity that, that ignites your imagination. If only to realize that you are a being of light, literally, and it's wondrous. Uh, just uh, for the people that came late at the beginning of the session, David did an exercise with uh, the energy in our hands. Um, so this video will be made available probably tonight. Um, but if you missed that part of it, I encourage you to check in on this video because it really helps uh, frame a lot of what was said afterwards. So um, do check that out. And we've got Ingrid at the top. We'll make this our last and let David go stretch his neck. Ingrid, if you can unmute yourself. I get the famous last words, huh? Yep. Well, I'm going to try to do something abstract here and make an analogy to um, sound, singing, music, and the vibrations in that. If there's a continuum between those vibrations, the vibrations of light, and the vibrations of the healing touch, I, I, I like to think of what we do energetically when we heal as something analogous to tuning and tuning whether it sounds good to the ear or not is bringing things back into balance and that balance is some sort of a natural balance that has somehow shifted out of phase and so when i like to think about healing even though you can't see it and you can't hear it you can feel it in your hands or in other ways people feel it in different modalities so that is my analogy so thank you very much for bringing it up, but I haven't done the hand trick in a while and it was a lot of fun to do it again. So thanks. Thank you. And you're right. It's all vibration, right? It's all resonance and dissonance, but it's all vibration. Let's, let's come into tune. Um, I encourage you to, let me type this in. I do hope I can remember it properly. While David's typing, I just, as a musician, I want to thank you for that comment, Ingrid. Um, I, it's something I do every day, and it's it's really interesting that when you're when you the deeper you get into music, it's like your body, mind, and spirit lines up, and and that resonance happens. And I, I suppose that's probably true for any sort of physical um, activity, whatever people are into. If you're into running or hockey or whatever it is, when you're when you're firing on all of those cylinders, you just feel a connection to, at least I do, feel a connection to the spirit. And um, I can't live without it. Uh, and your analogy just really hit home for me. Thanks for that. So I'm going to send you, uh, there it is. So I'm going to send you this YouTube video by a pastor in the States named Rob Bell, and um, the video is called Rhythm. Everyone, so how do I send that? Send, there we go. So if you click on that link, it's a lovely uh, presentation of exactly uh, what you talked about, how, you know, what is God? You know, what, what is vibration? What is, what is this thing that we're, we're trying to talk about and how do we come into tune with it that's a beautiful video so there's my gift my parting gift to you tonight and uh, thank you for joining uh this and for having me to to chat with you really uh really rewarding and um i encourage you in the coming week before our next session 
to practice this, this hand thing, to become still, try to be present and just feel, feel beyond your skin. All right, keep shining. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Another great session. I know it got a little technical there at times, but I think people got um, some something to take away from there. More food for thought. And uh, hopefully that if we practice that over the next week, more will be revealed to us. But I'd like to close with a prayer and also thank everyone for coming. This is really great. So this has been a sensational group. I'm, I'm really excited by this, but, but let us pray. Gracious spirit that infuses our consciousness. We're so grateful for David and his vital ministry in these very unprecedented times. Thank you for bringing us together. Again, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to these words. Walk with us over the coming week as we dive deeper into this Lenten wilderness journey. In your name we pray. Amen. Before I go, I see uh, Suzanne LeBlanc has asked a big question, which will be addressed in the concluding um, presentations uh, about near-death experiences. We will be talking about that. And um, uh, just a, a quick answer to that, uh, distressing experiences are very rare, uh, and we don't know a whole lot about it because there isn't much data. Um, but I'll, I'll share what we do know. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah, peace be with you, David. Bye-bye. There they go. Okay, thanks, Ronnie. Hey, hey Hetty, great to see you. This is our uh, one of our key spiritual leaders here uh, under Peter Gregor. Hetty is a living saint. So great to have you on here, Hetty. Thank you. And thanks, David. Yes, all the best. We'll see you next Wednesday. See you next Wednesday.